Hello, everybody. Um, it feels really strange. I can only see myself. Uh, but anyway, my name's John, John Jane. Um, I am uh, one of the team members, uh, the lead of Penguin, which is uh, sponsoring Polyglot Gathering Online. Um, as um, we are a new company, well, I sound like a robot. I'm really sorry. It's really strange to be talking to, to nobody. Like, I can't see anybody here. Anyway, I'll stop talking about that. So yes, I'm representing Penguin, uh, which is a new uh, language exchange website still in development. Um, but because uh, political gathering was happening and I thought it would be a good um, opportunity to introduce the program, uh, the website, if you go on there, penguin.com, it's two Gs you will see that some parts are not working. So please be forgiving and just send me an email if you have any questions or if you would like to join as ambassador. You can register now, um, but we didn't expand the number of languages uh, appropriate to polyglots. Um, we, we had intended to do that, but um, it didn't happen in time. Um, but hopefully by the end of the weekend, it will all be functioning. So please uh, be understanding and I hope uh, you, you will enjoy this talk. Um, the way that I want to do this is first describing the history of games and then pedagogical style and the language exchange and what benefits there might be with uh, games and language exchange. It seems like common sense um, and I think most people will understand the benefit of games, but there is uh, some barrier to, um, to getting this started because uh, some prejudice uh, exist still with games and uh, the significance or the implication or and the use of games in learning. Um, I'll start with an introduction about myself. So I am Korean and I was born in Korea and I grew up in Australia. Um, and then I studied uh, in Italy and now I find myself in Tunisia. Um, I studied medicine in Australia and I worked for a year um, in, a, in a hospital in Sydney. And then I decided to study philosophy. And after a year of that, I found myself in the seminary to become a Catholic priest. And so after six, seven years, I became a priest. And then, I mean, I was ordained a priest uh, and then I, I left the priesthood and became an English teacher here in Tunisia. Um, a little bit, and now, now I'm um, helping to create Penguin um, for language exchange with games. So my hobbies, uh, growing up, I played StarCraft. That was my main to-do. Um, I was really bad at every other game. So I just stuck with StarCraft for years. And like this one is StarCraft 2, the logo here, but like I couldn't even, I couldn't play that. It was really hard. Uh, I'm really, I can only play really easy games. Um, I'm a football fan. I follow Arsenal and I like snowboarding and um, traveling and learning languages. Uh, so this is my um, second Polyglot event. Richard Simcott uh, hosted Polyglot Conference in Athens. Oh, not, not Athens, it was uh, Thessaloniki 2016. And I really enjoyed that. And that's how I, uh, in, that's how I really began the journey uh, to learn languages uh, consciously um, with, yeah, with some effort um, put into trying to, to really put myself out there to learn. Um, so this is this is the this is one of the most ancient games. Um, it's called Zenit. Uh, this is the hieroglyphics. <laughs> just got it from Wikipedia. Gee, I don't know how. I think I think it's just the the phonetics. But this photo I took in Egypt at the beginning of the month when I was there it was in one of the uh, tombs of the workers' village in Luxor. Um, so it's it's just a, a board game. Uh, obviously, uh, you can't see the person here. But it's, the, it's one of the most ancient games that we have uh, archaeological evidence of. Um, so games have obviously been around in human existence for a long time. Um, this is Nefertiti, and she was playing this game too. Um, this is the depiction of the game. 
um, how how the pieces would would be put on the board. No one actually knows exactly how it was played. They they tried to de decipher the the hieroglyphics, try to put piece together through time um, how it was played. But it seems that the the rules of the game was different in different places and in different times, and uh, that was uh, one thousand to 1500 BC and we also have a more ancient game in Mesopotamia in Ur uh, which is as you can see uh, 4000 more than 4000 years uh, old um, and this is the royal game of Ur and of course we have similar board games that we play now um, so games have accompanied human civilizations uh, for a very long time uh, but we can actually see, if you know Squid Game, I'm not trying to uh, promote Korean culture or anything, necessarily, <laughs> but might as well. So <laughs> Squid Game showed a few games here. Here, this is Dakji, the, the blue and red paper game. And uh, you play, I'm not sure if you if you saw the, the movie, but uh, the, the Netflix series, but you play by trying to flip over uh, the, the, the piece of paper on the ground. If you're able to flip it over, then you take that. That becomes yours. Um, so in in the in my dad's time, like Dakji, those those paper, those paper like folds, they actually were currency. You know, the more Dakji you had, like the richer you were. So this is a a fun game that the kids played, but it built it turned into some, a, a form of currency. <laughs> um, and the and the Squid Game itself, the Ojingo game is. You know it's drawn in sand or on in dirt so in these in these examples we don't have archaeological evidence of such games what i mean by that is that games accompanied humans before uh even whatever uh, archaeological evidence we have of them so uh, that's probably quite obvious uh, games is, is part of um having fun is part of um existing uh living uh human life and uh, it actually goes beyond humans it's a uh, it predates humans um and you know game is i wrote here ambiguous term because you can say like a political game but here we will delimit it to a structure of play structured form of play so it's an activity with intrinsic motivation for recreation enjoyment and animals have shown uh, themselves to do this too um, for example, dolphins playing with uh, the puffer fish and uh, passing the puffer fish around. Um, I, I just put these example, these uh, funny examples. But animals also play uh, some form of structured uh, games, something that's repeated, something that seems to be done for enjoyment more than for um, for an, for another purpose like feeding. So, what about educational games? To, to say educational is already uh, inflected with a top-down approach to uh, pedagogy, to learning. So the most, uh, like one of the ways that games is used um, is to, to package something that's um, top-down considered to be beneficial. And, you know, you package it like broccoli, you hide it somehow, you mash it up and put it in ice cream. And then you deliver that. And games is a good way to do that. At the same time, um, it can backfire too, because, um, you know, uh, the baby, when, <laughs> when he or she finds out, then, uh, I mean, finds out that it doesn't taste very, well, very nice, then it might be rejected too. And I found this as an English teacher because I tried to create this uh, game of Monopoly, but it was it was um, with a vocab. So advanced English vocab uh, replaced um, the street names and st the students had to uh, define the word uh, in order to claim it as their land. And, you know, we had a lot of fun um, at the beginning and <laughs> the thing is it backfired the next time we played this game it was, I, I think we played it like a month later the students were like no 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 I don't, I don't want to play anymore because they realized that the the game was being used 
more more <laughs> as a tool than uh, as a as a time to enjoy enjoy and to relax. So this game uh, Boulder Dash, uh, some of you may know this game where um, you have words that are really strange but they are real words and uh, they have a meaning and everybody has to guess or ha has to create a definition a new definition and try to pass it off as the real definition and um, this game was much more successful with uh, my year seven and year nine students um, because it was more about about them it was more about uh, them uh, expressing something creative and having fun trying to uh, guess uh, <laughs> guess the right one as well. So in this way, I was able, I think, to to bring about uh, more more education in a way. Like it was a way of passing from education to learning, and this can be done in various forms too. If you look at if you think about uh, the F one formula, the Formula One simulation games, or FIFA. Um, even the game of life, like actually the people that created these games were not really trying to teach anything necessarily, but they made it good enough that, well, I don't know about the game of life. I, I don't know who's uh, living their life according to the rules of game of life, but, you know, with, with, uh, simulation games, people, um, who have interest in developing professionally or improving their skills, um, would play these simulation games and be more accustomed or, to, or at least get used to the environment um, so that they get prepared to, to go into the real world. And there's actually an, another benefit to games that's beyond the design of the game designer. So for example, this, this image of StarCraft, you know, StarCraft is, a, this reveals my age, basically it's the, it's the key, it, for, in our time anyway, it was the, the principal strategy game. And my cousin is very smart. He, he learned from this game something that now he applies as a lawyer, which is that when the other side, when the opponent has greater resources, then you have to use a strategy that is like somewhat alternative. Doing the same thing, doing the most, doing the more common things like just building up your army and sending them through the middle is probably not going to work. You have to do something sneaky. You have to do something a little bit different. And he 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 now applies that in his his you know the way that he prepares cases as, as a lawyer, and um, and this derives really from his experience in StarCraft. So games can have um an alternative or they can have another field of education beyond the the actual gameplay so when we when we start to talk about games and learning in and language learning we see that um it's somewhat limited but it's possible it's possible um so duolingo is a great example we have community designed games they design it so that hopefully the users will be able to step by step get into the language, um, but it's limited, right? It's limited. Um, and they do very much rely on uh, motivational uh, tactics like, okay, you got to play every day and then we'll give you this, you know, this is another form of gamification, which is a little bit different, but they try to, this is more psychology, trying to get people to reuse it. But I think it's actually very important uh, in language learning because one of the main factors to successful language learning to fluency is simply the, the amount of time spent learning, the amount of time spent using the language. And in that way, Duolingo, I think, plays its part. Um, well, you could ask, you could, yeah, you could say, okay, so is the broccoli actually being given? Is the actual language learning happening? And, and some people will argue no, but I think it's still uh, a good attempt at uh, bringing language learning to, to everybody, to the masses or to to at least for the beginner, it, it's it's uh, helpful, I would say. So in language learning, I've tried to consider it uh, as a balance of input and output. Um, there's no algorithm to say uh, you could you should put it output as a certain percentage, but at the beginning, um, it makes sense to be uh, 
considering input uh, as the main focus. Um, however, our, however, games play a, play a part in bringing output, like introducing output methods in your time as a, as a beginner, in your in your time as a beginner learning a language. Um, and polygloss, I just found out about it recently on Reddit. It's a, it's a way to play um, a, a form of output. Uh, it, it's a way to express uh, a description of an item, and you pass it to someone else to guess uh, the item. It's really interesting. Uh, you can download it uh, on iPhone um, or on Android. And then Edge Chainman, I just found out, I don't know if Mike Dietrich is here, but he's presenting, I believe, tomorrow or the next day. And uh, that looks like a cool way also to, to get into uh, expressing oneself in the in the target language. And language exchange, oh, I don't know why they, they were creating characters here. <laughs> but language exchange, um, is a form of bringing more output into your language regimen, uh, into your into your into your language uh, regime, language learning regime. And um, how how is language exchange uh, accepted? You know, um, when I talk about language exchange, people that are not used to it don't really understand how it's beneficial. But I try to say, you know, we learn a language, most people from our parents. And they are not necessarily linguistics professors. Somehow they were able to transfer their knowledge to us. And you could say, you know, this is a kind of a crude example, but um, this is, I know it might be a bit weird, but think about this. Would you rather have surgery performed on you by um, a first year medical doctor or a 20 year experienced vet surgeon? I know it's, I know, I'm sorry about it. I'm sorry to even pose that, but there is something about being um, experienced in the language without necessarily having credentials. I think uh, credentials obviously plays a part um, and, is, and is important because you could say, oh, I would not have any surgery from either of the doctor or the vet, the medical doctor or the vet doctor um, if neither of them had gone through university, right? So there, there is obviously something to say about people with professional ed educational education backgrounds in linguistics and in um, language education. However, language exchange puts power to those, to everybody, to to help each other to learn a language. And once you can accept that, when once you can accept that language exchange can be a powerful means of community participation as well as learning yourself, I think there's a lot to to gain from language exchange. Um, and this slide, this slide, I have to introduce this because the way the way that I um, I left the priesthood, um, the way that I left the priesthood is through this website called mylanguageexchange.com. Okay, so I was learning German. I had been learning German for three years uh, for theological reasons, and I said, okay, it's now time to to uh, step it up a level, and I wanted to go on uh, speak speak to more people. So I went on my language exchange and I found myself only messaging girls. I know this it sounds a bit funny, but, uh, but that's what happened. I only messaged girls and, well, pretty much. And I ended up actually leaving the priesthood because I fell in love with a woman I met on this. Okay, uh, that didn't work out eventually, but um, this is actually what happened. And, and Tandem and Hello Talk, um, you know, I can't blame people when people use them, use the app for that. Um, not necessarily, it's not necessarily a conscious thing. Like for me, I was a priest trying to be a, a good priest, but clearly I wasn't uh, fully self-aware. But in any case, this is what happened. And sometimes it's an unwanted thing. So this is why uh, we, this is why games is, I think, uh, uh, vital in language exchange. Um, as, a, as an option, of course, because of, some people are happy to use language exchange, um, uh, the traditional way, just finding a partner one on one, um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be romantic. So I would say for games, for to use language, to use games in language exchange, um, it's not really, well, I, as I said, some people can do it, but um, it's still very difficult, uh, I think, to, to initiate games with your tandem or hello talk partner, uh, language partner. I think it's going to be mm, 
I don't know. I think it was all, it'll all, it will have the potential for it to to lead to other things. That's just uh, my two cents on that. So if you want to find somebody to play to to have a language exchange, but not uh, for for it not to turn into something else uh, like a different type type of relationship, then I would suggest uh, a Reddit subreddit called Game Language Exchange. So there's only one e there, by the way. Language Exchange. Uh, there's just a one e. Anyway. Um, and you can you can put your profile there and and what games you're interested in and people will message you. And then there's disc, there are Discord channels. So obviously Discord is related to games. Um, so um, even though these are specifically language Discord channels, you can find people who are more interested in games. So these are the kind of games that I've played with my uh, language exchange partner and Tunisian Arabic tutor and uh, people that I found uh, on Discord for, for exchanging Korean and French and Italian. So he uh, is Gartic Phone, which is a new form of um, Pictionary. It's a new form of Pictionary because you have to come up with a phrase. Uh, everybody comes up with a phrase and then you take turns drawing it. And then, oh, it's a really fun way because they've put in like Chinese whispers element into it too. So it gets quite uh, entertaining. And then there are board games. Um, Yvonne from South Africa and Taiwan, she will be uh, talking more about board games tomorrow. She's the expert on that. But this is obviously a new, new version of the of board games, uh, Settlers of Catan. Um, any kind of game, anything that you can do together that will require spending more time talking and listening. And this is what I'm proposing as games for language learning. And that includes, uh, this is Uno, uh, online Uno called Pitsuno. And then there's novel games, um, which is just a simple, like um, simple HTML or flash, you know, old school flash, but it's, I think it's now all just HTML5 games um, that you can play multiplayer uh, with people that you meet on Discord or, or elsewhere or with your friends or whoever um, that you can initiate games with. Um, there is actually an academic journal called Ludic Language Pedagogy. Oh, there's a typo there, my bad. And it proposes that in engaging with a game in a group setting, uh, this is from a teaching perspective, it's helpful, it's more beneficial in terms of language acquisition when there is preparation in terms of getting to understand the rules, of course, and then allowing for obs observers of games. Allowing for observers of games, uh, they say, is critical because when you're in the game and trying to play, sometimes it's not uh, it's it's sometimes more difficult to focus on the language de development. Whereas the observer can can also learn a lot by watching the game interaction. Then you play, you practice, you receive corrections, and then there's the time of revision to be able to uh, to fully benefit from that interaction. So now I will introduce Penguin because all of these. All of these elements of language exchange, we and the gaming, we want to in, bring together in Penguin so that you can find all of those things, like finding the language partners, finding the, the the games to play. We want to bring it all together in Penguin, basically, to make it easier. And I'm learning, as I said, Tunisian, Arabic, and French. And you know, I live in Tunisia, but um, I still find it very difficult to find practice uh, practice time or speaking time. Beyond um, going to the to the little little uh, stores here and speaking with the store owners, um, even at the school, I, I was teach, I was um, speaking with the students, but it was still difficult to get enough uh, speaking practice, and that's why I think uh, we want to create like a daily event of playing games, um, like you know one hour a day where everybody comes together from around the world. And uh, we play games for that hour, and and uh, it's and we play with a language exchange, you know. Um, and I, I'm not we're not associated with University of Ulu, um, but they but somebody told me uh, after we had already started developing that there's actually this is something that people have been doing in Finland for for decades or, or at least a decade uh, in cafe in something called Cafe Lingua um, in in uh, northern Finland. They have um, a place where uh, you would gather every week and um, each table, like each bench would have a specific language and people will be 
uh, playing a specific board game in that in a language where an exchange student will be moderating. So this is so I was like, oh my gosh, like that's exactly the same thing that uh, we are doing, but in real life. So what we're offering is basically something that's been done before, and and we're just bringing it on online, I guess. So yeah, simply simply put, it's virtual rooms. Um, we put oh, sorry, some of the text disappeared, but we put everybody in games uh, in the in the specific language, um, the target language, and one of the people, one of the members will be a native speaker. Um, and if not a native speaker, then uh, somebody with a higher level fluency, hopefully uh, we can work this out, um, still yet to be tested fully, but um, with fluent speakers that have a higher level than you. Um, that's pretty much the concept. So it's an automatic matching. So you start, you press start, and then 15 minutes later, um, you enter into the next room. And then 15 minutes later, you enter into the next room. So because it's a group exchange, hopefully like at uh, the best in the best scenario, you'll be spending 20% of your time in your native language, depending on how many people are on. Um, and then 80% of the time, hopefully you'll be able to uh, play games in your target language. So the first game is this uh, guessing game. Um, we just, we're just trying to uh, bring in as many games as possible, but just trying to go in with the simple games. Um, the second game will be kind of like um, a Pictionary one um, and then like card games. So we just want to make it possible for people to, to speak together and enjoy uh, some time together um, and learning uh, or, or practicing speaking. And then um, what you what the native host writes in the chat, oh, it's not, it's not here. Oh, yeah, it is here. If what the native speaker writes in the chat as, as a form of correction, you'll be able to uh, revise um, in the next screen or after the game's events, you can revise uh, by making notes or putting it into flashcards uh, for you to revise uh, in the future. So, of course, you know, like playing games to learn languages is limited, okay? Like you can't necessarily, you won't be able to learn language to fluency necessarily just by playing games. I believe so you need to be able to revise spend more time to accelerate that process and it's an avatar only community um maybe this will change but at the moment this is how how we see it because we don't want people to be discriminated on appearance of or you know i don't know this might not seem like the, the most human move but it seems like the best thing to do for now um to be an avatar only um platform so that's what will be um to begin with um and I, and I think hopefully it, it will last like that. So it'll be for intermediate speakers. So please, uh, well, we would like to to help beginners too, but I think it'll be for intermediate speakers. So you, you will have to have completed some um, form of input training um, to, uh, to participate uh, in a meaningful way, I guess. But, you know, I was just in the, in the French room and I, I'm not good at French and that was still fun. So it's possible. Uh, and we're looking for ambassadors. So an ambassador would be somebody who moderates rooms in the native language and also gives feedback um, to the comments, kind of like on Hello Talk, um, giving feedback on grammar, uh, grammar and uh, language related uh, topics. And in exchange, we will uh, promote your uh, profile if you're a language tutor or have a website uh, that you would like to promote. Um, at the moment, I, I've been checking on our website. It's not working, the the actual uh, ambassador form. So I'm not sure. It might have been updated by by uh, the time that I'm done speaking. But I think you can just send me an email. Uh, this is my email, uh, john at penguin dot com uh, with two G's, and um, just let me know what what language you'd be interested in being an ambassador for. Um, and or if you have any questions, um, and I think I'm going to take questions now. If there are, if there have been, uh, if there are any, uh, any people have put questions up there. Okay, so for beginner students, as I said, it's uh, it has to be something that is, if, you know, in my experience anyway, something that they will be they will find palatable as a game. Um, as I've said, I've tried to use it as a way to package the broccoli and to present it in a way that's that's a real a real game but it's it seems to be um 
it seems to be very difficult to, especially a, a beginner student, a beginner uh, in high students in high school. This was this is my experience anyway. So you know, it will have to be something that um, relies more on on their creativity. I would say something that um, they can contribute to, something that they find fun. Uh, without feeling like uh, it's been designed to teach uh, in a in a top down way, um, that's all I would say about that. Um, so that that's why I I used um, Boulder Dash because um, you know on online you can find all these strange words, and um, you can have a, a quite a quite a lot of fun. And and the students, especially if they're like second language students. Um, they will they will get a lot of practice um, putting sentences together as well as um, listening to to the proposals that people have put out there. Um, so I think I think there aren't any more questions, but I don't know um, if you do have any extra questions. Um, oh, actually, uh, I'm getting a message here. Maybe I'll, oh here. Uh, could you see native speakers contributing recommended phrases? Which can pop up on the screen for lower level beginner players. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, okay, so so at the moment we have common phrases. Um, common phrases. This is what we've uh, proposed for the the interface. Common phrases for a game. This is kind of like the preparation stage. But I think this is a great one too. Um, we haven't integrated this one, um, but I think that's a good good idea for for the native speaker to, to propose phrases. At the moment, we are going to say, okay, we have common phrases that we that the native speakers um, prepare, right, at the beginning. But obviously, as people play the games, they're gonna have uh, better ideas or more ideas um, as to the phrases that could be said or that might be useful in the games. So yes, the native speakers, should, uh, we will we'll look into that um, for the native speakers to suggest um, new phrases at the moment we have like a way for the the target for for the learners to look up phrases that they want to say like oh my gosh I have no idea where this is and you can type that into the into the common phrases search bar and if we don't have that already in the common phrases then that goes automatically to uh, a native speaker I mean you know if, if somebody's there synchronous at, at the same time simultaneously, then of course you can just speak it or you can you can give it to the native speaker by text for for him or her to translate but uh, if they're not there then you that we're trying to create an asynchronous way to to interact with with a native speaker too so that if you um propose something um as a common phrase or something that you want to say then the native speaker later while playing the game will be given this prompt to help um, translate and to to add that to common phrases. Um, so I hope I hope um, that was uh, oh, okay. There's one more. <laughs> it's really strange. Sorry, uh, from my part, like I can't see anybody. That's why. Um, so yeah, when is it expected to launch? So so we already delayed. It was supposed to launch, uh, but it seems to be somewhat more difficult than uh, we had imagined. Uh, especially integrating the voice uh, chat. Um, so it's going to happen hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, I would I would like to say you know in within the week, but it's uh, it's I don't I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it seems like it will be in the next couple of weeks. And we want to support every language actually. Um, that's why. That's why um, I think it will be something fun for, for polyglots to participate in. Uh, we want to support every language, but we know that, you know, um, practically speaking, it's going to be difficult. After a while, there might be an imbalance in the languages. So it might happen that we have to put restrictions on certain languages because there are too many people offering one language. I think just by ratio in the numbers, like if more than 80, more than five times, if one language <laughs> dominates by more than five times in the number of people that participate, then uh, the next language, then it can become problematic. But obviously, that's a good problem to have, um, and I'm not sure if, if we will even we will we will ever encounter that. But yeah, we we want to open it up to to every language so that 
when people come on, like we can we can practice um, any language, including um, the like really really uh, the rare ones, rare, rarer languages, um, and you know. I, I spent, you know, I'm Australian. I spent most of my time, most of my life in Australia, and Australia is one of the one of the places with the most extinct languages, as we know. Um, and this is a shame. And I think I think we can help. I think Penguin can help. I think to help, Penguin can help preserve um, some of the languages that are finding difficulty find um, um, in uh, in finding newer generation speakers. You know. So that would be great to have to be able to host um, all the languages, um, village languages, all the languages that are currently being spoken and are facing difficulty passing on generationally. Um, it would be great to to introduce uh, more languages to to young people. I think that's it. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much for uh, joining uh, this session. And as I said, uh, let me just put my. Oh, my email is john at penguin.com. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, just email me um, if you want to discuss anything. Uh, if you want, if you have ideas, cool ideas. Um, uh, again, and uh, thank you so much. Um, and I hope to see you guys in the uh, the rooms uh, too. So thank you. Cheers.